So, good evening. Uh, welcome to this special Academy of Ideas Economy Forum event to give an official launch to Phil Mullen's new book, Beyond Confrontation, Globalists, Nationalists and Their Discontents. Uh, it has, of course, been a very odd year thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic. The world economy has taken a very major hit due to the widespread lockdowns. But it's worth taking a step back to look at the longer term trends. We've seen a shift in production of wealth from the sluggish established economies of the West and Japan to the fast developing economies in the East, particularly China. The result has been a variety of different tensions internationally. But if anything, we need to put that into even longer term perspective, particularly looking at how the world order established after the Second World War is in decline. How should we understand these changes? What do they mean? And how should we negotiate them to the benefit of everyone? Beyond Confrontation is a major work of scholarship, which I would very much encourage everyone to read. But it's also a hopeful work that aims to find a positive way forward. Now, before I introduce Phil, let me just ask you all a favour. During the lockdown and beyond, the Academy of Ideas has been working as hard as ever to host debates via Zoom. All of these have been free of charge, but they still cost money to produce. So if you could support us by donating to our work, please visit academyofideas.org.uk forward slash donate and anything you can give will be greatly appreciated. So let me introduce Phil Mullen. Phil combines business management with research and writing, particularly on economic topics. He's previously the author of Creative Destruction, How to Start an Economic Renaissance and The Imaginary Time Bomb, Why an Aging Population is Not a Social Problem. Is also very much a leading light of the Economy Forum, and I'm delighted he's speaking tonight. So the way this is going to work is Phil's going to outline some of the themes from Beyond Confrontation for 20 minutes or so. I've got a couple of questions of my own I want to fire at him, and then it's over to you for your thoughts and questions. So, and the floor is yours, Phil. Thanks, yeah. uh, everyone, for logging on for what is my um, first ever virtual book launch, and hopefully my last ever. Uh, and that's not only because I haven't yet worked out how I'm going to get the books into your physical hands at the end for you to buy. But anyway, as well as this uh, trivial and the many, many more serious negatives about lockdowns and the distancing measures, the, the past very strange half year is also, I think, a vivid illustration that there are periods when history seems to speed up. Many pre-existing developments have either come more clearly to the surface or have accelerated, not least within uh, international relations. Now, these repercussions from certain responses to the pandemic, I think I've had probably pluses and minuses for my book, because while many of its themes which were written during 2018, 2019, they're now much more apparent and tangible, uh, the other side of that coin is that sections of the book that uh, might uh, generously have been interpreted as making interesting anticipations, uh, they've instead become, uh, in some ways, statements of the blindingly obvious. Um, for example, I spent some time in the book spelling out the dangerous rise of what's called murky non-tariff protectionism uh, by uh, globalist multilateralist governments. And yet now, post uh, the, uh, the pandemic, the necessity for autarkic economic policies is being openly justified even by cosmopolitan commentators. They're being presented as the legitimate pursuit of resilience, uh, a buzzword of the, uh, of the last few months, uh, and as necessary for national self-sufficiency. And that doesn't just apply to the production of PPE and ventilators and vaccines, but that justification is extended also into other established healthcare products manufacturing areas and digital technologies. So being conscious of this uh, COVID consequence of what we can call lifting the lid on several of the book's themes, what I'm gonna do here is summarize three of its main propositions, which I think are most relevant to the contemporary period. First, that today's clearly enhanced international disorder is unlikely to go back into hibernation. Second, that most of uh, what today's Western leaders are saying and doing is making this fraught situation more perilous, even though that's mostly not their conscious intention. And third, in order to reverse these divisive and uh, confrontational trends, uh, there is an alternative approach, 
which we can pursue within the Old West. And that's the approach of national democratic internationalism. I'm going to break this trio of propositions into first three trends that are fueling conflict, then three aggravating threats from the West's political leaders, and finally three alternative political principles, which I think are relevant to all Western countries to help us to get beyond confrontation. The first proposition means that uh, the great Western delusion, as we can call it, is dissipating. This delusion was the belief that took hold during the post-Second World War years that the world had entered a permanent era of international order and peace. Big nation rivalries were supposedly a thing of the past, not just unfashionable, but obsolete. And this was an idea which was later reinforced by the ever-expanding interlinkages of economic globalization. I think that now fewer people retain this delusion. Uh, with three of these underlying drivers for this unraveling of the post-war uh, global order having been further magnified by the impact of the pandemic. First, as, uh, as Rob mentioned already, the shift in the production of economic value from the West to the East continues. And so far, the diverging paces of the post-lockdown uh, recoveries, looking at China and uh, America, point to this speeding up rather they, than the deceleration that some had been predicting just a short time ago. As a consequence, I think the unstable mismatch between economic and political influence in the world is likely to worsen. It's worth emphasizing here that what's happening between the US and China is not a classic great power struggle where one hegemon replaces another, similar, say, to how the US replaced Britain during the mid 20th century. Because whatever international ambitions China has, however aggressive its government is abroad, there are ginormous economic and political barriers, both internally to China and externally, to China replacing the US as the dominant global leader. So I think the near term uh, and even medium term geopolitical future is therefore less a sort of seesaw with declining and rising powers, but it's more likely to be a uh, protracted um, uh, 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 era of messy and potentially dangerous international disarray. The second source of this disorder is that the abysmal state of um, uh, industrial production of an investment within most of the advanced countries is not only continuing, but I think through COVID is becoming harder to camouflage. And as a result, we're seeing more overt competition within the developed industrialized world and the extension of those uh, discriminatory, protectionist, autarkic policies I mentioned earlier, which are inciting extra political frictions. A clear example is the recent tightening of, uh, uh, of measures to control inward takeovers of businesses, not just by Chinese firms, but by firms based in supposedly friendly nations, uh, such as the German government early on in the pandemic, blocking an attempted US takeover of one of its vaccine businesses. Such intra-Western tensions are in themselves detrimental to international stability, but on top of this, the open rivalries within the old Western alliance, I think make it even tougher for them to come up with a cohesive shared approach to manage the fair incorporation of China or other rising powers within a new international setup. The third source of confrontation derives from the deepening political and cultural malaise within the Western countries, which goes, I think, far beyond the effects of economic atrophy. Historically, leading politicians have often responded to unsettled domestic conditions by seeking to externalize their problems instead of doing much to get to grips with them at home, as the traditional search for foreign bogeymen in times of trouble. And this year, we've already seen increased militarism overseas. Uh, we've had British typhoon jets, American B-52 bombers recently doing sorties along the Iranian-Russian border. We've had France sending its warships into the Eastern Mediterranean as a warning against Turkey, as well as France adopting a more international stance, interventionist stance in one local crisis after another, from Libya to Lebanon and now Mali. And topping all these, of course, we've had the intensified campaign against China as the modern source of evil and the White House's uh, declaration of a new Cold War with Beijing. Uh, a Cold War to which France and Britain seem to be signing up, uh, although with resistance 
uh, still from others like Germany uh, and Italy, at least so far. My second proposition is that going beyond the familiar scapegoating of foreigners uh, and the extension of protectionist policies, I think some of the novel and specific responses of Western political leaders these days are aggravating this already highly combustible international cocktail. This does not derive from some rediscovered staunch pursuit of national interests, but from the exact opposite. What's characteristic today and consistent with the political class's overall lack of vision and objective is that their mostly incoherent muddling through is catalyzing disorder, not just at home, but across borders. In the book, I very much emphasize that these provocations, intended or otherwise, come from of politicians of the globalist multilateralist inclination, as well as from the unilateralists. So from Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden, as well as from Donald Trump, from the Emmanuel Macrons, as well as from Boris Johnson. There are varied but parallel attempts to hang on to the international status quo with the US and the West on top, are not reducing the prospect of confrontation as they claim and as they no doubt desire, but are actually aggravating it. In at least three ways, their conservative, with a small c, their conservative propensities are making the international situation worse. First, their collective attempts to pursue preservationist economic policies that block the long overdue restructuring of their dismal economies, that perpetuates all those divisive strains uh, that I've just mentioned. And so far, the pandemic hasn't seemed to shake this resolve to hang on to and protect their old economies. Though that's certainly a debate that could and hopefully will unfold in the months ahead. Secondly, the West's dogged attachment to their much trumpeted rules-based international order has itself become a cause of resentment and animosity. I explain in the book that this order was created in the 1940s, institutionalized itself through a very rigid, top-down, anti-democratic, anti-national framework which makes it nearly impossible to reform. Instead, that framework needs wholesale replacement with new international arrangements. And to be durable, the book explains that any new setup can't be imposed by the old powers, but needs to be negotiated between independent nation states. Of course, most Western politicians recognize that the rising nations need to be included in some way in global governance. But so far, this has always been on the West terms, within the old order that they created so long ago. And this approach is backfiring since it reinforces uh, the subordinate position of the rising nations and only tends to impress their sense of exclusion from real influence. And this is felt not only just by China, of course, but also, I think, within many other fast growing countries from India to Indonesia to Brazil. A third conservative input from Western leaders is the uh, international culture war that they've launched aimed at excluding China from being treated as an equal because of its divergence from traditional uh, enlightenment values. So we've had the recent attacks on China, for example, by uh, Mike Pompeo, the US Secretary of State, for not adhering to the supposed Western norms of freedom, tolerance and democracy. Now, there are a couple of obvious hypocrisies here, but I don't have time to go into them now. First, there's the hypocrisy that it was, in fact, antipathy to progress and development within certain Western circles that fueled much of the earlier uh, phases of China bashing, not least from some environmentalists. And the second hypocrisy is that rather large matter of how unfree, intolerant and undemocratic many Western societies are becoming. But leaving those two important points aside for the moment, Pompeo's approach raises the geopolitical stakes by metamorphosing what should be a political matter of how to establish a modern viable international setup into a fundamental contest of ideas and beliefs. And this conversion, which has really come to the surface in the, in, in the last six or seven months, narrows the scope for diplomatic negotiations over how to establish good working relations between countries. Because unlike trade wars or even technology conflicts, wars over values and cultures are not amenable to compromise solutions. Now that the dreadful Chinese Communist Party government is branded as not just authoritarian and illiberal, which of course it is, 
but also as uniquely evil, as intent on world domination, and as impossible to be trusted, then the only logical solution acceptable to the Western powers becomes some sort of enforced uh, regime change, something which uh, history, uh, unfortunately, repeatedly tells us never ends well. Representing an international power mismatch as a war of cultural or moral values, of good against evil, brings worryingly to mind the US Vice President Dick Cheney's famous remark a year before the invasion of Iraq in 2003, when he said, we don't negotiate with evil, we defeat it. The third proposition in the book is to insist more positively that there is a political alternative to this uh, perilous inflammation of international relations coming from both the globalists and the unilateralists. This replacement is national democratic internationalism. And it's necessary both to oppose today's warmongering, but also to help develop the necessary global settlement that corresponds to today's and not last century's configuration and composition of countries. Now, I don't offer a blueprint for these new arrangements in the book because the crucial point is that they need to come out of a deliberative process between countries that is only possible with fundamental changes in how the West pursues its foreign affairs. And I argue that this alternate approach has to rest upon three foundation principles. First, national sovereignty. Second, democratic decision-making. And third, the recognition that genuine internationalism starts at home. Firstly, against the globalist promoters of a uh, famed borderless world, we need to establish that nation states continue to exist and that effective national sovereignty is the best thing possible for global order. The predominantly national form of COVID control measures, despite their many, many problems, at least provides fertile ground for pursuing this argument. The primacy of national sovereignty is a precondition for the second fundamental principle I outline, that of popular democratic engagement, because it's only as citizens of particular national territories sharing a common public space and with specific duties and responsibilities to one another, that we are able as political equals to, in to interact with each other in democratic fashion. And such strong working democracies are I think necessary to help block the drift to confrontation. For a start, with opinion polls in advanced countries generally uh, showing that a majority of people think that they're government should stay out of the internal affairs of other countries, the effect of accountability to the public can constrain the foreign adventures of our political classes, because these leaders are much more prone to cause havoc abroad when they shield themselves from their electorates. However, given the heat of today's China bashing campaign, that majority public opposition to overseas intervention could easily fade, and therefore it's vital to build a case against all intervention, political as well as military, by outside forces in the domestic affairs of other countries, including in the domestic affairs of China, however much we despise the repressive actions of the CCP. And beyond this immediate task, energizing a positive, outward-looking national spirit can incorporate the wisdom of people in better managing our unstable international environment, including by assisting our elected representatives to come up with sensible suggestions for how to work alongside other countries, whether those territories today have democratic systems or not. This leads to the third principle, that meaningful internationalism starts at home by dealing with our many domestic problems. Instead of the present orientation towards the scapegoating of these external monsters that is only stirring up all these international enmities. More positively, and I'll end on this point, the best way I think for promoting international cooperation and also for encouraging the struggle for freedom elsewhere is to protect and enhance freedom and democracy at home. Now this is already, as we've discussed in other uh, sessions uh, run by the, by the Battle of Ideas, this is already a huge uh, uh, and essential fight given the spreading culture of intolerance all around, but it has international benefits too. Free and confident nations can be more effective partners with other countries and will be better cross-border negotiators for preserving international stability. In addition, and this is 
I think one of the most immediately relevant messages in the book, given the protests going on today in Hong Kong, in Xinjiang, elsewhere in China, as well as in other undemocratic countries, is this. Stronger, freer democracies in the West can provide better solidarity and can offer a beacon of inspiration for people in other parts of the world who are fighting their own freedom struggles, including at the lead of those in China. Thanks very much, Phil. Um, that was a there's a lot in there, so I hope that we get a decent chance to explore all those ideas. Um, and I'll come out to um, everybody in the audience very shortly to, um, to get your thoughts and questions. But I had a couple of my own. The first one is, it's uh, a familiar idea. There's, there's, a, there's a sense that we're never going to have any really serious military conflict or real uh, international breakdown because the world is too close tightly entwined through trade. We have these very, very complex global value chains now, you know, that we, we buy our iPhones from China, but China's buying coal from Australia and all this. Um, we're just too integrated now. There's too much to lose if we start a major conflict. What would you say to that? Is, is that just complacency? Um. I mean, it's part of what I've referred to as the, the that great Western delusion, which um, uh, I explained that what you've just described, all that economic integration, um, uh, you know, has reinforced that idea that, you know, we're beyond, we're beyond those sort of conflicts. My short answer to, to your question is, is uh, can, uh, to, can economic integration stop war is, is no. Um, uh, and I try and explain in the book um, why a deterministic um, belief that economic factors um, and trade relations can prevent a war, um, I think uh, blurs what's really going on. Uh, and it is, uh, 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 it, it does it does engender that sort of complacency that you referred to. I think historically it's quite easy to show that uh, trade and investment relations don't stop war because we have to look at the last 150 years. There's been a in greater increase in trade and, and capital flows and so on going on. But uh, you know, we've had a fair few wars over that 150 years. So at the very least, trade is, uh, is not a reliable peacekeeper. I mean, it brings the obvious example, or, or uh, probably the most stark example, was that discussion that took place uh, before the First World War, when I think for the first time there was that sort of uh, uh, very strong sentiment that interdependence stops war. And it was a response to a book by Norman Angel, which I refer to in my book, uh, a book called The Great Illusion, uh, in which uh, writing at the high point of, global, of what's called Globalization 1.0, there's a high point of trade and, and international flows uh, before the First World War, he argued that it was the, the, the illusion he was referring to is the illusion that wars could benefit uh, a countries economically. And he explained, no, that uh, war is, is both uh, socially irrational, but also economically irrational. It's bound to be damaging. Now, he himself, Norman Angel himself, didn't say this was going to stop war. He was quite worried that war could simply happen. But his book was interpreted very widely as meaning this interdependence means that war is impossible. And of course, you know, three years later, uh, not only were uh, Norman Angel's fears uh, come to fruition, but also those uh, 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 sort of wishful thinking readers uh, their uh, complacency was horrendously disabused by the, the slaughter of the Great War. So th th I think the way of looking at this, just to conclude, is that I think going to war is a political decision, right? It's not um, something that's just done lightly, in particular wars between great powers. Um, and in that decision, um, you know, economic factors really fall, fall away. I mean, there's a, the, I'll finish with one analogy from the recent period is that we've heard about the pandemic being talked about as a, you know, it's a, it's a non-military uh, uh, parallel, but we talk about the, 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 the pandemic being, uh, a, a war being engaged on the pandemic, you know, the war against COVID back in, uh, in March time. And, uh, you know, when that war is launched, you know, the economic effects of the lockdown uh, were, were completely subordinated, at least initially. And in a sense, that, that indicates that you know, politics does trump the economy. So, uh, uh, and that's something which therefore means that we shouldn't rely, uh, we certainly can't from history's experience or from today, think that that's going to stop a war happening. Having said that, I don't think war is about to break out. <laughs> okay, so uh, my other question uh, is, is that your positive, uh, so a sort of potential happy ending in the book is about the, is, is taking the, 
this sort of decrepit post Second World War order, you know, America in charge and countries like Britain and France having um, seats on the UN Security Council that perhaps you know, they don't sort of warrant these days given uh, their political and economic power. But why would uh, America and Britain and France um, and Europe more generally give up that world order uh, voluntarily because it's so useful to them? The dollar remains the world's sort of reserve currency and that's just very, very important for America economically. And obviously America has you know, massive military power and diplomatic power as well. But even Britain and France you know, have this influence that is out of all proportion to the you know their standing in the world. So yeah, so so how can so how will they voluntarily give it up? Will you know, will they be enlightened enough to see that this is necessary to to move on from this in order to um, stabilize and provide for a, a new a new diplomatic and political order? Well, I, I, th I think you very well illustrate why the incumbent powers are going to be status quo powers. I mean that. You're right, they don't want to give up their positions. They want to preserve things as they are. But the big problem which I'm trying to draw out in the book is that, um, as we all know from our private lives, our personal lives, you know, wishing for something doesn't make it happen. You know, I might want to wish for winning the lottery, but that doesn't make it happen. So this is a situation where the wishes of those declining powers to hang on to things is actually having the, 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 the counter effect. Um, Certainly what they do, because they are in those positions of uh, notional authority in UN Security Council and so on, uh, can slow things down, but I don't think they can freeze history. And that's because of this mismatch, which uh, I talked about and just referred to again, that, that, that uh, you know, the, the, the global status quo, which they want to preserve, um, is, a, is a very imbalanced, unequal state of affairs, where bluntly, you know, the leaders of the countries which uh, represent, you know, by 12-15% of the world's population think they are justified in uh, dictating to the rest of the world and that's a mismatch which you know has been building for some time can go on for some time um, but you know sort of can't last forever uh, and the, the, the point I the, the irony I draw out in the book is that the the actions of status quo powers in trying to hang on to the way things are are actually undermining the status quo you know that their 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 efforts to uh, perpetuate the present is what is accelerating the fracturing. I mean, to give one example that was in the news this week again, which you know comes and goes, which is about the setting of um, uh, of international standards for um, for uh, digital data security, and uh, the Americans have been pushing, as as you would expect them to, as being the hegemon, to set the standards, the international standards for data security, and that's part of the whole kicking of. Huawei hardware and stuff out of, out of telecom systems. Now that is, uh, uh, you know, a very, a very open way in which the powers that be want to perpetuate and extend into new areas of standards and regulations and so on, uh, them being on top, in fact, openly to the exclusion of China. Not surprisingly, China this week is launching its own international uh, set of uh, global standards for data security. Um, uh, in response to that, and so what we're having is this, 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 uh, 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 and this is this is happening in a number of areas. These parallel institutions and parallel sets of rules, rules being set up, which then creates that uh, uh, and, uh, and gives gives expression to that fragmentation of the existing order. So yes, the status quo powers would like it to be that way, but their wish uh, is is actually backfiring on them. Great. Okay, that's clarified a few things for me right I'm going to go out to um, the audience so I've got um, Mehdi up first so thanks Rob uh, and thank you Phil <coughs> for that uh, presentation the question I have actually touches on on um, what uh, was um, Rob's first question but I'm ask it anyhow because I'm coming from a different angle. You did mention uh, the um, regime change and obviously there are different waves of regime change. What is perhaps vis-a-vis -vis China is not going to be the shark and all type 
the Iraq type of regime change that uh, we saw um, in 2000 and, uh, 2003. However, it looks that what essentially the West, but in particular United States, is after is for a um, prolonged and perpetual um, Cold War, trying to manufacture, trying to initiate Cold War uh, against China, vis-a-vis -vis China. And in doing that, there is obviously the military industrial complex in the United States was actually behind that and, 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 and pushing for it. But that to a large extent, perhaps, depends or its success depends on um, whether the countries in the Western Europe will actually join as it did against the uh, Soviet Union for, for, the, um, uh, for the Cold War against China. How do you think that will actually turn out in the way that China has actually had greater inroad into Africa and into, into Asia? And uh, with its uh, Belt and Road Initiative, it, 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 its power or its tentacles are more uh, extensive than the Soviet Union. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Mehdi. Um, John Holbrook. Um, yes, thanks, Phil. I found that very interesting. But I just wonder if, you're, if it's a bit bleak, your analysis, because you don't really see anything positive in what's happening at the moment. And hence your third theme about um, the, the sort of utopia that you'd like to see, which, by the way, I, broadly speaking, agree with doesn't seem to have any grounding in what's happening at the moment. It's almost like you see the pendulum continuing to swing in the wrong direction. You want to swing it back in the other direction. I, I just wonder if there is something positive happening at the moment, because uh, the globalists, it seems to me, are very much in retreat. And there is a, there is a greater interest in assertions of national control over national economies. And isn't that all a good thing, whereas I suspect you would rather dismiss it as, as autarky. Um, but, but, you know, isn't Trump, for example, doing some good things on trade? Isn't the West right to hold China to account? Um, isn't the West, generally speaking, right just to get better terms for trade and investment and to have more control over their own industries? So I, I just wonder if you're failing to see some um, positives in the current era. And I'm wondering if you're perhaps failing to see it because you see that as all a bit right wing, whereas you want to come in with some sort of revolutionary alternative. And I'm not sure <laughs> that's... Okay, great. Thank you, John. Um, Carrie Dingle. Thank you, Phil. And I have ordered the book off Amazon, so um, not all is lost with a Zoom meeting. And I do, you have inspired me to read it when it arrives. <laughs> Quick questions. Um, firstly, do you think there is anything in who wins the US elections, given from what you've said, it would seem that, um, unlike John's point, that Trump and Biden are equally um, China bashing in their efforts. So I just wondered if you think there is anything to be said for who wins on the international stage. Secondly, when you talk about the positive alternative, and your uh, internationalist national democratic alternative, which um, sounds really good. What does for you that mean in practice? Because I've been talking to young people who've been in prison, for example, in Belarus, with all the, on the democracy marches. And it's, it seems very hard to, you want to express your support for those kind of things, but at the same time, you want to oppose any foreign and external intervention, which would seem to be the way all of these things go at the moment. So I just wonder what solidarity means to you uh, in that regard, whether or not you can even go that far in the book. 
very quickly, do you see there being more hotspots other than you've explained the point about it's not going to be a repeat of the past with one hegemon replacing another, but are we going to see more Syrias, more Yemens, more, you know, third party countries being the hot hotspots, do you think? Do you see that as a, a dangerous or potentially problematic area? And finally, do you think there's any international or global institutions, I can't think of any, worth preserving? <laughs> Right, okay, there's a lot in that. Thank you very much. Um, I'll take Jagdish and then I'll come back to Phil because there's already a lot on the table. So, Jagdish. Yeah, hi. Um, hi, Phil. Uh, it's a very interesting talk. Um, I just want to pick one point because I think other people have mentioned a few bits about some of the other things. Uh, and that's about the point you're making that ch it, it, this doesn't look like China. Um, is going to replace the United States as a global power. And I'll probably take issue with that in the sense that uh, my sense is that China is playing this game in an entirely different way to the way the USA uh, took over um, from Britain and so on, because Britain and USA were at least, uh, you know, on the surface on the same side, but this China is, is uh, you know, not seen as being on the same side. But my guess is that, <coughs> excuse me, I guess is that the, the Chinese have uh, basically are playing by a different set of rules. So all the people who are used to looking at things through the same old lens in the past are all looking in one direction and China is actually coming along from a, a different direction entirely. I mean, I'll give you some examples. I'm, you know, um, they, they've, uh, the investments in raw materials in a lot of developing countries that have, they've been doing for many years, kind of very kind of uh, under the radar kind of investments. It's almost like, uh, you know, sowing the seeds for the future kind of uh, growth and uh, future needs that they'd have. Uh, the impact of new technology, which is, if you like, borderless. In the old days, if you wanted to take over a country, you know, got a few bunch of people together with guns and so on, went and kind of invaded a country, etc. Now you don't need to do that. You can sit somewhere in your, in the, you know, Lubyanka or wherever it mm -hmm. is in Beijing, and you can kind of, I think things are transforming in the way uh, takeovers are going to going to happen. Um, and, and the other point people keep mentioning is about is finger pointing at China about the human rights record and so on. And this is, you know, you know, this is kind of ignoring that the United States, Britain, France, they built their empires with their hands dipped in blood, torture and all the kind of things which they think China is doing. They did the same and if not worse, but they just labeled it as something else. So I don't know whether there is any difference in terms of, or I don't know how many people are paying attention to the fact that they keep pointing at these human rights records. Don't get me wrong, I mean, I don't support the, uh, the, you know, the assault on human rights of uh, Chinese people, but I think it, it, the game is, is going on somewhere else. We're all looking in one direction, but is it possible that actually they've changed the rules and the, they're changing the game? Uh, and they, are, they look like, to me anyway, they look like they, they would be replacing uh, the United States uh, because the United States is, it's got the United States really worried. It, it suddenly looks like it because they're trying to attack China on lots of different fronts. But I'll, I'll just leave it at that. But it okay. um, be here, interesting to hear your response. Right. Okay. So, floor is yours, Phil. Pick up on whatever you choose. Okay. Well, just picking up on, on Jagdish's last point there in terms of, you know, the, uh, the, the worry that America has. And... Uh, I think I think the a thing which unites all my response to all the questions is that it is the worry within America and with the, in the West, which is the dynamic to this, rather than uh, the uh, you know a, a coherent assessment as to what China is up to. I, I I don't disagree with anything you said, Jagdish, in terms of uh, China's uh, external um, economic interventions and its its gaining influence and the attempt to to gain soft power and stuff. But I think the idea that uh, that China is in this great great power conf confrontation and is on the verge of world domination, which is the way the West is describing it, is I think extremely far fetched. I mean, things can change certainly, but I think to understand what's going on today, and the reason why I'm to to answer John, uh, you know, a bit bleak, is because I do think that the dynamics within the West, the responses to the West, um, sort of rudderless approach to uh, not just domestic, but to international politics, is potentially very dangerous. Uh, it's not because, 
uh, you know, the West has got a coherent um, uh, uh, appreciation of uh, China's growing strength. Uh, it's precisely because they've, they've for time, um, you know, uh, ignored that in some ways, were, you know, uh, had this belief that, you know, China would either, and, you know, the, what people call about a, a sort of a, a schizophrenia or a, a, a sinophrenia. They, they often have two different views of China at the same time. Then China is either going to collapse out of its own internal contradictions, or it's going to, you know, somehow um, uh, democratize itself and become part of the Western order and so on, um, or it's going to, you know, now become the world dominator, right? So, so it, it's, it's got all these sort of confused ideas, and it's precisely those confusions within the Western elites which is what makes me concerned about what's, go about what's going on. So the fact that John talks about, you know, the globalists are a bit in retreat, that, that's true. The globalists have not had things going all, the, all their own way. That's true. Um, but that, I don't think, makes the world, uh, a, you know, a safer place at the moment. Just to focus in on the, the answer to that then on Kerry's question, what could the American elections uh, do to change this? I think, uh, and I try and explain that I think the same dynamic unites both the, the globalist multilateralists and the unilateralists, which is that their, in, their, their impulsive response to the sense of being out of control of the world is to try and hang on to the way things are. And therefore, I don't think the election of Joe Biden versus Trump is going to make any difference to that. Uh, in fact, what it, what it would do clearly if, 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 if Trump, or not clearly, but I think if, if Trump were to be reelected, he will double down on it and say, you know, I got elected because I took this hard line uh, against China. I'm not being uh, pushed around by China. And we'll see this as a vindication of extending the, the China bash and extending the Cold War with all the consequences that have. If Joe Biden were to get elected, he'll be arguing, I think, well, uh, great, we got rid of one of these horrible, you know, economic unilateralists. Now I can show that multilateralism still has some life in it and I will build uh, uh, an international uh, alliance against China. You know, I will go to America in the way that, um, uh, uh, in the way that Trump has not been able to do. I will go to, the, to, to France and to Britain and to Germany, and I'll build an international alliance against China. So it'll be the same sort of externalization of internal problems, whether through the personality or through the, the, the personages of a unilateralist leader or a multilateralist leader, which is uh, uh, raising the international stakes, and that's the problem. L let me end on, on John, just to, to, to sort of try to counter my uh, bleakness that you say, uh, is that there, I, I agree with you, there are positive things happening. You know, you know the Brexit uh, vote was a positive, uh, uh, was a very positive thing. That was a setback for, uh, for the globalists in some way that accounts for you know, the way the globalists have responded today. I think they're, they're, they're trying to somehow cohere themselves, but they're doing it around what seems to be an easy target of China. But then things can get out of control when they, when, when, when they, when they do that. So there are positive things, and those positive things are you know, a, 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 an awakening of people to uh, ordinary people to the sense that something can be done. You know, maybe out of you know, what's going on today in this whole furore over the rule of law and international law and is, 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 uh, uh, is the Tory government sort of breaching law and stuff. I mean, that would be a very useful discussion to come out of the open, which something positive could come. If we can turn that discussion into, uh, uh, into explaining why should, we should always be very wary when international law is used uh, to justify anything, because the long history of international law is that it's been used to cover many acts of, uh, of uh, of, 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 of oppression and intervention, whether, you know, in colonial days or more recently in wherever, Somalia, Syria, Iraq, wherever, international law is always um, called upon to justify um, uh, 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 undemocratic actions. Here we have it brought home to us in that there's this conflict between, uh, you know, what Britain thinks should be its way of running its economic policy, whether I agree with state aid or not is a, is a secondary question here. But the British government is saying, we should be in control of our economic policies. Uh, and if that means, uh, you know, uh, tweaking what was in the, uh, uh, the, the, the withdrawal agreement, so be it. That's a political question which, uh, which uh, should be debated, not on legalistic terms, but on political terms. What's right for, uh, uh, for the national interest in this case and what it means to be sovereign, free from uh, European Union control. So those sort of discussions, I, I think, are great and they wouldn't have happened five years ago. So 
So I'm not as bleak as, as John is saying. All I'm saying is that uh, it, it, the, for these things to, uh, for these things to um, come to fruition more, we do need to, I think it's very important that we do need to challenge what is you know, number one on the international agenda at the moment, which is this consensus from the unilateralists, from the globalists around China bashing. And that is something that could get out of control in a bad way. Okay, thanks very much, Phil. Um, right, back to those hands. Um, so, uh, our next up is um, Richard Ings. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Robin. Hi, Phil. Um, I, very, very quickly, four, four very uh, observations, four things that I've been thinking about, which is uh, been provoked by what you said. First of all, uh, you may not want to take it up again, but do you think uh, a democratic nation should tear up uh, uh, agreements it's come to, whether you consider them to be uh, you know, uh, bogus or not. I'm in favour of Brexit, but I'm not sure what I think about tearing up an agreement. Uh, the second thing, do you think the Ho Hong Kong protesters are being used to weaponise this? I mean, I'm all for democracy, but shouldn't we butt out of that? And the offer of uh, letting two million uh, citizens, um, you know, on diktat come and, and live in this country doesn't seem to be a very anti-democratic anti thing to do. So would you agree that Democrats shouldn't be in favour of, of, uh, of that policy? Um, uh, the third thing is, uh, a lot of people are about, talk about the interregnum, the First World War, Second World War interregnum, um, and how far, you know, we seem to be aping that with our populist movements and rise of the right and all this sort of rubbish. Um, uh, how much validity would you, would you attribute to, to some, of those, some of those points? And um, uh, would you agree that the sort of the lack of any political coherence is actually the problem that we have nowadays with mass movements as they seem to be all over the place, unlike the very well uh, thought through ideologically uh, Nazis and communists. The last one is the um, to do with France. I, I think France, and I, I would say this as someone who observes France uh, so diligently and goes on about it all the time, um, is that I think France is the country to watch because I think Macron preempted this uh, a couple of months ago when he came on and said that we need to start talking about um, uh, um, bringing things back into the into you know sovereign nations and so on and so forth and let's talk to our friends in Africa because he has been right ahead of the curve in, in Lebanon um, basically going over there and saying, listen, we'll run, we'll run your country for you if you like. And we seem to have a, a, a real kind of, well, perhaps not a return to old colonialism, but a sort of neo-colonialism where a country like France can go to the Lebanese and say, look, how do you fancy us running your country for you? And they're kind of going, yeah, we don't mind. And, and in many ways, I'm not sure if the people wouldn't be in favor of that because they're so against their national leaders. Um, they might think that why, well, why not give France a try again? Um, I don't know if that would happen in Algeria, but I could certainly see it happening uh, potentially elsewhere. So is, is France ahead of the curve in, in terms of, you know, establishing a new way of doing things where it's making alliances with, with some of its old colonies, which of course, Britain is probably a little bit stuck as far as that's concerned. I think we probably burnt too many bridges with our old colonies. Nice. Four, four questions that will quite easily fill an entire session. Thanks, Richard, uh, for, the, <laughs> for that uh, contribution. So, um, on to uh, Hilary. I've got probably a very basic and stupid question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, so, I, I work in an industry where lots of work is, is outsourced uh, offshore to a place like India, Portugal, uh, Russia, even now. Um, and, and that's that's you know on one level you can see that as, as really quite problematic because that is you know um capital using a kind of reserve army of labor uh if you like to kind of drive down standards of um work uh, terms and conditions in, in in the west but at the same time it's kind of hard to make those kind of arguments here so just don't in terms of what phil you're saying about internationalism starts at home you know how, how do you fit in those uh, actual practical things that are happening in industry now with that kind of an outlook it, it's kind of it's, it's hard to me to argue that that what's happening is is good for workers in india either as well as it not being good for for, for workers in the west so um how, how does all that fit together brilliant thank you very much great question uh monica jansen yes um what I wanted to talk about is um, this idea that democratic internationalism is at all viable because history always tells us that nation states act out of self-interest and even when they form international units such as the EU, the League of Nations, the UN, there are still 
confrontations between the members. And when you have nations like Russia, which are not remotely interested really in internationalism, I don't think, uh, they're just interested in causing trouble and uh, creating havoc, then I, I wonder how this, this democratic internationalism is actually practical and actually workable. And um, this idea that, you know, nation states will always act out of self-interest and will only use internationalism when it serves their own. I mean, look at the EU, that's a perfect example of that. Um, so as lovely as it sounds, I just think it's a little bit um, utopian, I suppose is what I'm saying, a bit like communism. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really work. It could never really work. You may say he's a dreamer, but he's not the only one. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, Monica. Um, I'll, I'll bring in Jenny and then I'll go back to... Um, I just wanted to return, Phil, to this question of international law as against um, national laws. Um, uh, obviously, with the uh, uh, with Johnson sort of wanting to introduce this internal market bill, they're really stressing how minute the changes are, and that it's really just a tweaking of international law. Um, but uh, to, to push a bit further on this, um, I think you've really emphasized that international law has become a real cover for the status quo powers um, in a number of different areas, both international and, and also as a way um, of, of shielding themselves from democratic um, uh, questioning. Um, very, uh, very much like the EU um, laws and regulations and everything um, shields, um, you know, national governments from from really being answerable to their electorate. Um, but would you go as far as to say that we would really have to argue for a dismantling of much international law? Um, and for the um, for for uh, 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 arguing for in fact for for national laws or certainly for control over national laws in the national interest. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Uh, right, Phil. I think I'll focus on the international law so side of things at the moment because. Um, and it also allows me to answer uh, uh, one of Kerry's questions, are there any international institutions that are worth preserving? I would take as my starting point, no. I think, I think all the international institutions and legal uh, uh, organizations that have been set up, and legal arrangements have been set up, have generally been detrimental because they, were, they all came out of, uh, looking at the for last 75 years, out of a, you know, a political settlement in which there was a great suspicion uh, of uh, you know, nationalism, which was seen as a inherently uh, uh, a brutal and barbaric uh, um, uh, political uh, political form of arrangement, and they were all uh, extremely suspicious of of ordinary people getting involved in things. So it was a it was an anti politics, anti uh, national, anti democratic sentiment, which led to the privileging of these national international organisations and of the international law over the national. And, uh, you know, I, I, I very much shared, I think, Jenny's sentiments on that, which is that uh, we, should, we need to turn things upside down again. We need to say um, that international law is always, it, always it expresses power relations, both in the making of laws and in the interpreting of laws. And uh, that is not a viable way of, uh, of establishing a stable international order. I mean, the point that Manuel Kant made, you know, a, a very, very long time ago in his, uh, in his, in his uh, essay on perpetual peace, which is that uh, international order should be, or international arrangements should be based on the relationship between in the free independent nations, and that uh, international law as an imposition on that does not help at all, but is actually detrimental. And I think we've seen that over the, uh, in terms of the consolidation of, uh, uh, of the use of the law, we've seen it I think as Jenny alluded to or mentioned maybe in terms of the sort of international human rights law, which has been a way of abrogating national sovereignty. 
And all that's happened increasingly since the Second World War that was problematic before then, and I, I get some examples in the interwar years in, in the book, but increasingly since 1945, International law has been privileged at the at the uh, to the detriment of uh, of national law, and we do have to turn that upside down again. That's why I think what's going on at the moment is not so much. I mean, the circumstances to why this has happened today in terms of uh, the British or internal market bill is a. Uh, I haven't read the bill yet, but what I can see they're talking about there. Uh, you know, I, I I don't think it's a question of dismissing it as being oh, it's just a technical small thing. It comes out of the. Uh, product of that fudge of the withdrawal agreement which you know people hoped would go away but uh you know they the, the, there was a bit of a concession made there in the withdrawal agreement which uh is, is coming home to roost so to, so to speak and uh, it does then become a political question not a legalistic question as to who decides who decides how economic policy should be should be should be uh, carried out i mean it's a bit ironic this is blowing up over primarily for state aid, or that's one of the two aspects of it, that uh, Britain is saying, well, we, we're not going to get pushed around in state aid, um, uh, which I think is the right position to take. It's a political question. It's a, a, a question which we fought through, not as a technical, small technical change, but fought through in the, in the House of Commons and you know, engaging, hopefully, a broader conversation, popular conversation about that, as to why this is the right, the right thing to do. It's somewhat ironic that uh, many of the people in the House of Commons um, uh, are themselves uh, 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 examples of people who've used international law to uh, justify their own um, uh, 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 evasion of political responsibilities. I mean, the state aid thing um, has been used in, uh, on many occasions by British politicians to say, well, we can't do this, we can't do that form of intervention, we can't help out here or do that. And whether those decisions were right or wrong, it was always just by saying, well, this is the EU state, you know, the EU state aid rules, i.e. international law is preventing us from doing what some people think should be happened. So a political discussion always gets shunted off into saying, well, we are told by the international rules. So that's why I'm so um, uh, 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 skeptical or not skeptical, so critical of the use of international law as a reason for, for, for anything these days. Can I just say a little bit on Hillary's point? I think... Um, I think that's very, I mean, it's a completely different topic, really, but I think it's the international division of labor, which is what she's uh, referring to. You know, how do we deal with the fact that uh, there are companies operate both nationally and internationally? And that's, again, a theme which I try and explore through the book, because that is the nature of, of the modern world. And I'm sorry about the modern world, you know, going back the last couple of hundred years. It's the nature that businesses operate both nationally and internationally. And I think whatever the motivations are, and often, uh, uh, and often businesses go abroad because, again, to escape problems closer to home, you know, they've got profitability problems at home, so they go abroad. But broadly speaking, the extension of an international division of labor, the bringing of more of the population of the world into economic relations with each other is, I think, a positive thing. Uh, and I think, you know, the setting up of operations within India, whatever the motivations that particular businesses had to set them up there, is generally a good thing for, for the Indian work class. The wages may be a lot lower than people are paid in Britain, but it is a, a, it is a, it is a step forward when you have the extension of, of, uh, uh, of production relations and trading relations and so on, because it creates that pos positive potential of bringing more people into, uh, into economic activity. I think the answer to it, to Hillary's point, is that there, in order to um, uh, 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 balance that, is that you need stronger activity at home to you know, prevent wages being, being forced down. And that then comes back to the fact that what we've got control over is not you know, the wages of workers in, 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 uh, in uh, Mumbai or in other countries, but is what happens within our own national territory. So again, the internationalist element of it takes place at home, that we argue for national minimum wages, we argue for certain conditions of work, which um, are things which we can enforce here. And, and if that leads to businesses feeling they don't want to do this or that abroad, so, so be it. But it's, it's a question of generally seeing that internationalization is a good thing in terms of raising living standards around the world. China, of course, is a classic example of that with you know, hundreds of millions of people brought out of poverty as a result of being brought into the world market. But that's balanced by our national responsibilities of ensuring that uh, people's wages and living conditions are not undermined at home because of that. 
Great. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Phil. Um, right, I'll go back out. And uh, Helen Sarles. Um, I have a fairly basic question, which is, um, and I have the book, so I have it and it's good. And I've started reading in it and it's really, really good. Um, the only thing I wanted to, not the only thing, one of the things I wanted to question is how far the whole kind of China bashing uh, makes sense. I mean, I understand it politically and I think you explain how those conflicts kind of come about uh, in the realm of politics very, very well. But it seems to me that the impact of China bashing is simply just going to strengthen China and it's going to make things worse for, for you know, particularly in America, it's going to make things worse. I mean, she has now come forward with this policy, which I think is called dual so circulation, whereby he's going to kind of try to develop his own economy and then have this sort of international policy um, and try to have them moving at the same time. But it, it seems to me that an autarkic response from China of trying to develop its own economy does make a lot of sense, whereas an autarkic response from the, the United States is, you know, which is a much more um, decrepit kind of economy, doesn't make so much sense. And so it seems that as a result of all this attack upon China, it's just going to make China much, much stronger. Um, and so kind of lead to countries like uh, US being in a, in a worse position than they started off with. So I can see the, the kind of drive for these political confrontations. And, um, you know, I understand the difference between economics and politics in terms of you know, uh, that, you know, economic integration doesn't necessarily lead to peace, but I just don't see in any real sense how this can work as a way for America to, um, you know, solve any of its problems. I mean, John, I think it was John said, some of these uh, tariffs on Chinese goods, you know, maybe make sense. I mean, I, d I think in the long term, cu America cutting itself off from China is cutting itself off from growth and dynamism. So I just wondered how that kind of fits into all of this. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Andrew McDonald Powney. I'm, I'm concerned I don't really, I don't really have an answer to this, but I have a, a concern that this debate doesn't really get to the heart of it, possibly because um, the heart of it is a bit difficult to face. It may be. Um, I think China's not managed to take over the existing system until now, principally because of language. And that when China manages to expand its control of the Indian Pacific Rim, that will change. The new Silk Road will be in place. They will have control of the maritime equivalent. They'll have in their own theater the capacity to set up an alternative system with their own currency as the reserve currency. And they'll do it using the debt that we have happily given them which we like to call investment. Um, and it, it, does, it does concern me that they're not trying to take over the Bretton Woods system. They're trying to pose an alternative and as far as I can see are succeeding. And that, that has, that's happened largely because in the West, we have found it very easy to sit here without really reforming our own societies that much in any terms that touch money and to preach to the rest of the world about a whole set of social rights and to link investment to those rights. And that means that people simply get investment from China. So by, by our human rights agenda, or more specifically, by taking the human rights agenda in the way Amnesty International and others have done, down the social route instead of the political route, from going away from political prisoners to social issues more generally, We've simply alienated that investment, helped China set up its debt traps, expanded China's influence. And here's the nub of the thing, as far as I can see. Because we want the things which are produced by this system we're allowing China to run, we have gone along with this ourselves and put ourselves in hock to China. And um, for as long as we are happy to live in permanent debt, I don't really see how they are to be resisted. So it seems to me that the, and I do think they need to be resisted because I think things are organ harvesting and labor camps. 
are things that need to be resisted. So it seems to me that people have to make a, a choice, which I don't believe they're going to make, about being prepared to live in a different, simpler way, which will involve sacrifice to themselves. And they tend to see themselves as workers, but in fact, they are the lower paid members of the global rich. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew. Interesting points there. Um, Daniel Benami. Yeah, I'd like to ask Phil to comment on recent developments, which clearly couldn't be covered in his book, but I imagine that his, the framework he's developed can inform uh, his discussion of these developments. So in, in particular, the impact, not of the COVID virus itself, but the measures taken to lock down large sections of the population uh, across the world, in fact, in the vast majority of countries in the world. Because, I mean, it seems to me, well, as Phil described it, he wrote his book in mainly in 2018, 2019, when you did have a demo democratic upsurge with Brexit and so on. Uh, clearly, there was a reaction against that, but that was, I imagine, informed what he was writing about. And while that hasn't gone away completely, it seems to me we've had a backlash uh, in which, by the, by the elites, in which the public, to a large extent, have been squeezed out of politics. Uh, and in some cases, you've had legislatures literally suspended and you know, not meeting, not happening. So, I mean, maybe John Holbrook would describe that as bleakness, but it, it seems to me to be the situation that we're in that we, I think, clearly the vast majority of people in this meeting want a kind of democratic renewal. But the situation we have right now is we have a backlash against any kind of democratic renewal. So how does that, how does his analysis, inf analysis inform our understanding of that situation? Or does he have a different take on it completely? Plenty, plenty to get your teeth into there, Phil. Uh, do far away. I think that the framework I have is, uh, uh, that I developed in the book, is to sort of separate out what's been happening in the sort of economic sphere of international relations and what's happening politically. And although clearly, you know, that the two are not autonomous, there is a bit of an independent dynamic to them. So this is, uh, I suppose, entering or starting to uh, touch on or uh, begin to approach Helen's questions. Because I think if you look at the international relationships, it is, as she was uh, suggesting, uh, you know, irrational to decouple, you know, that, that uh, and I'd say it's irrational from both points of view, really, um, uh, but more so from, from the West, because you've had a situation over the last, what, 40 years, where the West, Western economies have coped through internationalizing, and a big part of that internationalizing was moving capital into China and other parts of Asia, uh, and uh, uh, more recently seeing these uh, growing middle classes in, uh, in China in East Asia as a, as a huge attractive market. And, 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 and to that extent, it's been beneficial to, to the West. We've had the point that, that Andrew's focused on, which is the debts that are built up alongside that. Uh, and that, uh, uh, that, that's, that's uh, you know, clearly a problem for the West in that it's internationalized its economies without, uh, and in fact, use that as a bit, of an, a, a bit of an excuse for not dealing with its domestic problems, for not addressing its problems of living beyond its means. And it's been able to both financialize, build up these huge debts, living off the future, and internationalize in a way which has helped it to cope. Uh, and it's coped through you know, the fact that uh, I think for American businesses, you know, a third of their profits comes from overseas activities now, whereas it was, you know, 10% back in the 1970s. So they've benefited from that internationalization. They've benefited from, you know, cheap goods coming in, as, as, as again, Andrew was, was referring to, cheap goods coming into, into the West to uh, compensate for, you know, living standards not increasing because productivity has not been growing here. So all those ways that internationalization has helped. And in that sense, Helen's right to say that it's irrational to cut yourself off from that, to think that decoupling or to think that uh, trying to box in China is, is, going to, uh, is going to help. I mean, I think decoupling or, uh, you know, being able to turn that, uh, what people talk about is turning back globalization, that de-internationalization, is I think going to be a very, very tough job, you know, that, that it involves a political will, which I think is lacking. You know, I think... I think, uh, and this refers to a point which I wanted to com comment on and what Richard was saying, you know, is that the lack of 
political coherence in the West is that is that a, an asset or a liability for them in terms of their their international relations, and and it's it's generally something which is is, is making them is making their life uh, you know a, a, a lot more a, a lot more difficult. Um, so so their the irrationality of it in terms of thinking you can decouple. Um, it's not something which I think they're going to have the, the uh, uh, capability of really forcing through uh, at, the, at the present time. I think uh, in that sense, the, the sort of the dither and the impetuosity of, of Western international, uh, uh, international um, sort of policies, um, I think precludes that really, really going to that direction. I mean, that's why something like, if you take something like reshoring, which has been a big uh, issue in America for some time, you know, that, that Somehow, if you simply try and reverse what's gone on in terms of that internationalization, it will make things, uh, it, will, it will solve problems at home. Clearly, it doesn't. Uh, I mean, I think it's something like a 300,000 at the best estimates or something like that of, of jobs which have been repatriated out of the, you know, the, the, the millions which have gone there. Um, but, um, uh, you know, leaving, leaving the numbers to one side, to, to, to a side, because I, I think they're pretty phony, uh, even the numbers which have been, which have been uh, uh, estimated. The problem is that they're not restructuring at home. They're not going to create the new jobs to be able to balance what they what, what they've lost. So it's the evasion of the domestic problems, which is which is which is what is, is fundamentally uh, uh, problematic. So to to conclude on that on on, on what Helen was saying, is there a, is there a danger in what's been happening in terms of trying to decouple? Won't that just accelerate um, what uh, China's development? And I think in a sense that that is that is is true. I think. I don't think it's it's causing it. I think there is that symbiotic relationship with which both have benefited. I think China has benefited a lot from the capital imports coming in, but the extent to which attempts are made to block it off, then it will uh, accelerate its plans to to create its own industries. I think it's already gone further in that way than some than some uh, 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 realize. Um, and I think something like you know cutting off Huawei from you know from Western or American based uh, uh, microchips. Is clearly going to uh, encourage China to accelerate the development of its own microchip industry. In that sense, uh, you could say that's a positive thing for China, uh, but it's, it's obviously not going to solve any of the problems in the, uh, any of the problems in the West. Obviously, there. Okay, so so uh, a last chance for uh, anybody who wants to, to to join in the discussion and to um, uh, raise your hand. So please do. Um, I just wondered if coming back to COVID. Um, whether there is anything about what's happened economically that means that kind of restructuring is going to be forced upon them, um, upon governments in, in, in the West. I mean, um, we know that the UK government isn't, isn't exactly um, you know, a decisive um, force at the moment. I mean, it can't even sort of hold the line on the exam results for more than five minutes, never mind you know, restructure the economy. Um, so where's the drive going to come from from that? But is, is the very fact that they've locked down society going to mean that a lot of this restructuring is in a way forced upon them? I mean, we've seen quite a few um, highly high profile companies, for example, go out of business uh, during the course of this or look like they're tinkering on the edge. Um, you know, that have been on the edge for quite some time. So in, so in the discussion in your book and uh, ending creative destruction, you talk about the need to kind of clear out the dead wood, to clear out the zombies. Is there any, anything in, in, in what's happened that, that might sort of happen, if not because of a, pol a structure, you know, a sort of strategy that it might actually just come about because of, you know, of the sort of downturn that we've seen um, in the past um, few months? I'm going straight back on that one. Oh, right. Um, well, uh, um, yeah, I think that's uh, a good question because uh, I think the way um, my focus in the earlier book, which I, which I uh, obviously build on in the current book on creative destruction, I think um, sometimes that's interpreted as a sort of automatic process that if, you, if things are destroyed, then new things will come up to replace them. And, you know, that's very much not, the, the arguments I was making in, in, in the original in the original book, nor are they uh, pertinent to what's necessary today, which is a, 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 a the domestic economic renewal is a is a part of that um, uh, focus. I'm arguing in the current book on uh, taking matters into our hands as to what 
is possible at home. I don't see it as utopian, I see it as, as necessary at home. And uh, there is no automaticity that with the mass unemployment which is coming with the industries which are closing down, that that will somehow uh, create um, the um, uh, some um, uh, dynamic towards things being created. I think the market system is, is too dysfunctional for that. I think the whole uh, ways in which we've uh, seen the decrepit debt dependency and the, 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 the struggling to just to hang on what exists shows that there's no dynamic for renewal which could come spontaneously. It could only come through a, um, uh, uh, some sort of collective uh, some sort of collective effort. Um, and I think that, you know, perhaps, um, you know, refers a bit to what Daniel was talking about in terms of what the implications of the COVID uh, impact, both economically and politically. So I think economically it's going to be devastating, not just in Britain and, in, and as, as Daniel was alluding to, in a, in a number of emerging countries as well, who've, you know, come to the conclusion that in following the West into their lockdowns, it's actually created the worst of both worlds for them because they haven't got the health resources to deal with the pandemic and they've just got collapsed economies now. So, you know, countries from like India and others are having to, having to, uh, you know, to, 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 to reverse that. But in terms of the economic devastation in, in, in the advanced industrial countries, um, that is not something that's going to automatically fix itself. It's not going to come up with some new, some new sectors. Clearly, there will be a, you know, a few things happening. There'll be more you know, people doing deliveries, more uh, you know, Tesco's online deliveries are recruiting people, Amazon's recruiting people to do more you know, warehouse pickers and so on. There'll be stuff like that. But in terms of the building of new sectors of industry, whether it's in energy or in transportation or in construction stuff, that won't come about uh, spontaneously. So uh, on the, the sort of the political aspect of what Daniel was referring to, you know, haven't people been put on the back foot by COVID? You know, is, aren't the working classes, you know, haven't they lost that, um, uh, 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 that, that sense of, of being able to do something which seems to be expressed through the Brexit vote? I, I, think that's, I think that's a bit too bleak to say that that's completely gone. I think it's it's up to um, the it's up to it's up to it's up to uh, the impact of what's going to be happening and the discussions which will be forced around that political discussions which will take place around the mass unemployment and around the destruction of sector industry. Uh, it's an, a, an opportunity to intervene in that to actually say, well, there is an alternative. Don't blame China. Don't blame the third world. Don't blame all the developing countries for our problems. Our economic problems are homegrown. But there is a there is a possibility of, of creating something new, uh, uh, but th that's that's going to be something which is going to have to come out of that uh, of, a, of a critique of the protectionist preservationist impulses which are everywhere at the moment. Right. Okay. Brilliant. So I'm going to bring in Claire Fox and then Para, and then I'll ask Phil to for his sort of respond to those points that Claire and Para want to make, but also to sort of sum up the discussion. So uh, Claire. So you, you've sort of just um, answered some of the questions that I was uh, thinking about. I um, I was I had a meeting with someone today. Um, I thought I'd get it in before it became illegal, and uh, they were actually suggesting that uh, it was a, it did feel a little bit like a war in terms of that creative destruction. But one of the things that we were talking about, this person who works in business, one of the frustrations around you know reminded me at the moment in terms of the discussion that's going on at the moment about the withdrawal agreement and so on, is this kind of obsession that the economic gain of Brexit might somehow be, you know, is, to, is confined to a discussion on trade. You know, everybody's obsessed with trade deals and who you can do business with. But it's also the case that one of the promises of the Conservative government when they, uh, as it were, won the Red Wall and, and some of the discussions around that, forget COVID, was talking up some of the big infrastructure pro did know that they had a domestic problem that they needed to do something about is the point I'm making that there, w there has been that Boris's build build speech you know and not being frightened of using the state and so on but they say it and then they don't do it and apart from noting that they're spineless in some ways I cannot understand why they don't I mean why is it that they can't see through their own rhetoric when it would appear to be in their best interest. So I know that this, this is a rather crass way of posing it, but 
you know, you end up having conversations with people about whether Boris has had the stuffing knocked out of him by having COVID or whether it's because he's got a young uh, girlfriend and a new baby and all these kind of conversations. It seems inexplicable. Uh, Claire, thanks very much. And uh, just go on to uh, power. So Phil, right at the beginning, uh, you spoke about why China is not necessarily looking to have hegemony. And you mentioned particularly about the political uh, internal and external barriers that China faced. Uh, when you sum up, could you perhaps expand a little bit on that as to what you think they are? It's plenty for you to, to both tackle and to then sum up, Phil. So too far away. Okay, uh, I'll say a little bit of that last point in terms of China, but that's not the, the focus of my, you know, specialism or the fo focus of the book. But I think, um, I think generally we overstate, and I think, uh, you know, what Andrew was saying a bit earlier went along with that. I think we overstate the, um, you know, the strength of China at the moment. I mean, I've, I've, I, I responded to Helen by saying that, you know, China has developed huge amount economically over the last 30 years and that's been a, a positive to the Chinese people a positive to you know global society that that that, that has happened but China is still uh, far behind uh, the uh, advanced industrial countries in terms of uh, productivity and so on so I think it is wrong to overstate the uh, the the economic strength already of China I think it's dynamic it's ambition means that over the next 20, 30 years, it'll become e even, even stronger. Um, um, but I, I think in terms of translating that into the idea that it's on the verge of hegemony, that somehow, you know, once it becomes as big as America, whether that's, you know, in, you know, on sort of, you know, mar market exchange rate terms or whatever, when, when that happens, whether it happens in 2026, 2028, 2030, something, somehow something tips over um, I, uh, and it can become the hegemon. I think underestimates that internally it's weaker, not just it's, it's politically weaker than it seems. I mean, we have this image which is reinforced by all the China bashing of saying that, you know, that this what is a very repressive authoritarian regime is in complete control of society. Uh, it, it, it's not in control of everything that's going on. That's partly why it's, I think, responded a lot more aggressively, both internally in terms of repressing and in terms of clamping down in Hong Kong and in terms of some of its uh, you know, international diplomacy. I think it's, it's either the, the Chinese Communist Party's sort of fear of not being in control and, and, of, and of seeing things get out of control, which is, which is, which is, driving, uh, um, uh, which is driving some of its aggression. Um, but that very process of, of becoming more aggressive as it deals with its weakness also, I think, highlights that it's, it's not able to exert international authority. I mean, drawing, drawing in countries, as Jagdish, uh, Jagdish talked about earlier, through the Belt and Road Initiative and, and uh, helping build infrastructure and bringing development to those countries is one thing. But in terms of drawing um, uh, people to, to identify politically with uh, what is an author openly seen as a, as a repressive authoritarian regime is something very different. And I think uh, in, in some ways, some of it's uh, what's called its wolf warrior diplomacy, it has actually backfired a little bit in terms of making other um, uh, uh, non-advanced um, uh, countries a bit wary of, of uh, uh, getting too embroiled with China. So it's probably slowed down some ways its ability to spread its political influence. I mean, I, I think, you know, in time, um, China will achieve its objectives, which are, are stated objectives being a regional uh, uh, power with global influence, um, uh, and it, it, that is something which, in a rational world, the West should should have to respond to. The problem is that the the West is, in a sense, exaggerating uh, the, the the danger from China as a as as an evil power which is about to dominate the world, not because of really what's happening within China or in terms of its analysis of what's happening in China, but because of its own it, its own problems at home. Um, and, and I suppose that's where, where, where I'll end, really, in terms of the, um, uh, what I picked up from what Claire was saying in, that, in, the, in the interruptions of her, of her video, um, which is, you know, given that the Tories, say, in this country, or maybe in terms of discussions going on about, you know, new deals in, in, in America and elsewhere, you know, isn't there an opportunity that out of this devastation of the, uh, of the uh, accelerated devastation which has come to the fore, which was there before COVID, it's not caused by COVID, you know, the, the destruction of, uh, of industries and the, 
the uh, preponderance of low paid, low productivity jobs, the productivity stagnation, the lack of investment, all those things were there before COVID. But is there a way in which the shock of the COVID um, acceleration of that and bringing to the surface how fragile and decrepit Western economies are, isn't that something which could uh, prompt a better uh, political uh, uh, response from the existing classes? I don't rule that out, Claire. I think it is it is possible, and it is something. To, and, and in some ways, things are more open than they ever have been in that respect. Um, uh, but what it tends to drive um, political classes uh, is to try to preserve what exists. The very fact that they don't have a coherent vision and a coherent set of objectives, which is what characterizes uh, 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 Western politics for 30 years now, is both what leads them to externalize problems and try and bash China and try and see a problem, uh, a solution to its problems overseas. Um, uh, but it also means that they uh, it, it hang on to what exists. Uh, they try and protect what exists. And that's why what's, I think, one of the most striking consequences economically and politically of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of the pandemic lockdown for me is that not only has state intervention become completely re-legitimated and accepted by everybody, but so has protectionism, you know, that, that both, uh, you, know, uh, you know, unilateralists or both unilateralists and who've always been partial to it, but also multilateralists are now very open saying that to protect is the right thing to do. Don't be shy of the word protect. Protect, they say, uh, uh, as I remember hearing uh, uh, the French finance minister Bruno Le Maire saying, you know, don't be scared of the word protect. It's not the same as protectionism. Well, actually, when you're protecting your local industries, when you're putting up barriers to um, uh, uh, others coming in, or when you're, you're putting up barriers to protect your own industries from foreign takeover and stuff, that is the nature of protectionism. And that's the thing that's become so acceptable today. Uh, and that shift towards the acceptance and the recognition of, of those autarkic protectionist policies is, I think, uh, uh, you know, a political consequence which is not consolidated yet by any means, uh, and you know, perhaps gives us an opportunity to actually counterpose an internationalist to that uh, now more universally embraced uh, protectionism which has come to the fore. So yes, uh, a brilliant discussion. There's so much in this book. I firmly recommend you read it. I'll put the link on there again. And oh, somebody else has done it as well. Very good. Um, uh, can I invite all of you to, um, Unmute yourselves and give Phil a big round. Hello, Phil. Thank you. That book. Uh, now I'm going to mute you all again because you're going to start chit chatting, aren't you? Um, so, hello. Um, so, um, if you enjoyed this, the, uh, this discussion again, please do uh, consider giving us a donation at academyofideas.org.uk forward slash donate. Um, there's plenty of other um, Academy of Ideas events coming up. You can find those at academyofideas.org.uk slash events. One that's got a particular economic fo focus and has been the cause of the spilling of much um, column, ink, columnist ink over the last uh, couple of weeks has been uh, the idea about working from home is that going to become the new normal the social policy forum uh, is going to be discussing that on the 30th of September is working from home working um, so look out for that uh, thank you again for uh, coming along and spending your time I'll leave the uh, discussion open again for uh, people to have a chit chat for five or ten minutes if you've got any sort of more informal questions for Phil if he's still there uh, then uh, please do fire away um, so um, thank you very much and good night.